You know, some people say that Americans are politically divided. And sure, that's true in some ways, like the fact that we're on the brink of civil war, but that doesn't mean we can't all get along. Because in fact, when it comes to the far left and the far right, they really have a lot in common. Now, of course, the far left and the far right are in different situations. The far left owns the presidency, the Senate, the deep state, the news media, Hollywood, and academia, or as they call themselves, the resistance. So they're trying to figure out whether to destroy the country by polluting the minds of children with sexual deviance or by printing so much worthless money, it's cheaper to start World War III than to buy a loaf of bread. The far right owns the comment section of InfoWars and some really cool Star Trek memorabilia, so they're trying to figure out how much Fortnite they can charge to their mother's credit card before she catches on. But once you get past these superficial differences, the two sides are so similar, they really should be the best of friends. For instance, they both hate Jews. The far left hates Jews because Jews won't allow their race to be exterminated in order to put an end to genocide. Also, Jews have been oppressed by racism more than any other people, yet they use education and intact families to thrive without government assistance, which would be disastrous for the left if blacks ever caught on. The far right hates Jews because they have big noses and rub their hands together while chuckling in a sinister manner before unleashing their space lasers on Hollywood. Plus, they've enlisted hundreds of eminent historians to perpetuate the myth of the Holocaust with photographs and documentation, whereas if you only read one article by a hate-filled lunatic, you realize the whole thing was faked. And once you see it, you can't unsee it because you've only read one article. The far left and the far right both hate marriage. The far left hates marriage because it leads to happy, independent families who don't need the government to build well-run lives that uplift the financial and moral standards of everyone around them, thus foiling the left's brilliant plans to build a state-run paradise of perversion, crime, and despair. The far right hates marriage because it's for simps who get lured into becoming simp husbands and simp fathers by conniving women with their sneakily alluring bodies who then suddenly divorce the simps just because they caught them having computer sex with a 13-year-old Korean prostitute who was actually a 45-year-old fat man manipulating a deep fake video. And then the divorce laws destroy the simp man's life because we're living in a matriarchy, which is also a 45-year-old fat man manipulating an AI video. So if simps avoid marriage, they can become alpha men or lonely schmucks. The far left and the far right both hate democracy. The far left hates democracy because at any moment, some guy who doesn't even live in New York City can express any opinion he wants and then vote for someone who will destroy democracy, which left-wingers love, as long as it's not the democracy with voting in it, because left-wingers hate that democracy, which threatens to destroy their democracy, which is the one where everyone who disagrees with them goes to jail. The far right hates democracy because they want a powerful, strong man to put all the communists and homosexuals in prison while Zionist NGOs cry boo-hoo-hoo just because a few rights have been violated. Because the Zionist NGOs are also simps who don't like powerful, strong men with their bulging muscles and sweaty smell, which the far right loves because they're alpha men. And there's nothing alpha men love more than being dominated by powerful, sweaty, strong men who hate homosexuals. And more than Jews, marriage and democracy, the far left and the far right both hate each other. Because whenever they look at each other, it's like looking in a mirror. And looking in the mirror is what the far left and the far right hate more than anything else. Trigger warning, I'm Andrew Claven, and this is The Andrew Claven Show. All right, we are back laughing our way through the end of everything we hold dear. It is International Women's Day, and it's also the anniversary of the Soviet Revolution in Russia, the Russian Revolution. And that is not a coincidence. Uh, International Women's Day was, in fact, founded by socialists who are trying to lure women out of the house because Karl Marx and Engels believed that if women stayed in the house, they wouldn't be able to take over uh, the economic uh, means of production, and the government wouldn't be able to take over the means of production because people would have families and would be happy and wouldn't care to have their power taken away from them. Uh, And so they wanted women out of the house, and so they founded International Women's Day to celebrate 
working women. So this International Women's Day, I'd like to say happy International Women's Day to all the women who were smarter than the Soviets and the socialists and stayed home and did the one thing that really matters. I'm always telling you that, you know, you can't just win with a negative approach. You have to have a positive approach. Socialism is not going to be defeated by the men who go out to fight it, but also by the women who stay home and produce something far, far better. Go on to YouTube and sign on to the Andrew Clavin YouTube channel. You can watch me there. You can watch me on Daily Wire Plus on YouTube. I think you also get some exclusive content. Uh, you can see me playing Helldivers 2, I think that's what it was called, and making a total fool of myself, which I know some of you will enjoy. Uh, we also have the interviews there. We have the interviews everywhere. You can get them on audio. You can get them anywhere. Last week, uh, we interviewed Jay Burden, who very young, very articulate a uh, guy who expresses kind of the Gen Z vision of the right. And next week we will be talking to Ann Coulter. I know a lot of people don't like Ann Coulter. I love Ann Coulter. I don't always agree with her, but she is a terrific writer, a wonderful person, and one of the smartest people watching politics. And she's just unwavering. I mean, one of the reasons people don't like her is because she doesn't care whether they like her or not. She's unwavering in saying what she thinks is the truth. And I will ask her all the questions you want to ask her. I always love talking to her. Also, if you leave a comment on YouTube and the comment violates all the laws of God and man, we will read it here because that's what we're all about. Today's comment is from Keverember. Keverember? Yeah. It says, this Lent season, I'm giving up not clicking on Clavin videos immediately when I see them. That will that gets you instantly into heaven, I believe. And uh, oh, we also got a comment from Pearl, which I really appreciate from Pearl Davis saying, uh, excited for the next chat, Andrew. I really do appreciate you having me on. Can't, can't wait to come back. And uh, I, I will take some time. I don't like to have people on right away afterwards, but we will have her back. Let's get to today's episode. Fantasyland is burning. A lot of politics this week, the State of the Union, Super Tuesday, Nikki Haley dropping out. But first, we have to address the all-important question of Sidney Sweeney's decolletage. In Chapter 1, I, too, admire Sidney Sweeney's breasts. Using the internet without ExpressVPN is like forgetting to mute yourself on a Zoom meeting and having everyone hear your side conversation with your coworker. It may just be a bit of harmless banter, but what happens if you say something you don't want everyone else to hear? Internet service providers track every single website you visit. They can sell this information to ad companies and tech giants who then use it to target you with their ad programs. ExpressVPN reroutes your network data through a secure encrypted tunnel so your internet provider can't see or sell your online activity Sounds complicated, but ExpressVPN is so simple to use. Just fire up the app, click one button. One subscription works on all your devices, phones, laptops, even routers, so everyone who shares your Wi-Fi can be protected too. Here at The Daily Wire, we are proud to have ExpressVPN as our top privacy partner because we believe everyone should be able to protect themselves from big tech's prying eyes. Protect your online privacy by visiting expressvpn.com slash Clavin today. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S vpn.com slash Clavin to get an extra three months free. Expressvpn.com slash, how do you spell it? K-L-A-V-A-N. Now, I always tell you that you get tomorrow's news today here, and nowhere is that more true than when I'm speaking about the culture. I am one of the best cultural observers there are. There is one of one of those. And, uh, you know, I, everybody this week was talking about Sidney Sweeney's appearance on Saturday Night Live and, most importantly, about her breasts. And I just want to say that I became aware of Sidney Sweeney's breasts way back in 2021 when she took her shirt off uh, in a film called The Voyeurs. And I you know, I don't usually watch movies more than once, but I've watched that about 15 times, although only about two minutes of it. Uh, just an absolutely beautiful, beautiful woman. And now the whole world is talking about this because of the fact that she wore, in several appearances on Saturday Night Live, she wore a uh, she went heavy on the décolletage, let's say. A décolletage is a low-cut neckline. It's from a French word meaning expose the neck. And, uh, you know, everyone keeps playing the end where she really comes out and her she had a big décolletage. But I just want to play the beginning because I like that better where she's talking about her co-star in her latest movie, this Cut 16. The craziest rumor I've seen is that while I was filming Anyone But You, I was having an affair with my co-star Glenn Powell. 
That's obviously not true. <laughs> Me and my fiance produced a movie together, and he was there the entire shoot. And I just want to let everyone know that he's the man of my dreams. And we're still together and stronger than ever. He even came here tonight to support me. Can we uh, cut to him? <laughs> yeah, no, that's not my fiance. He's in my dressing room, and we've got a great show for you tonight. Casey Musgraves is here, so stick around. We'll be right back. Now, I, I like that the, they cut to the guy in the audience and it's her co-star that she's supposed to be having an affair with. But I like that because not only is she incredibly shapely and beautiful, she, she's also, by the way, a very, very good actress, but she's also girly and adorable. And I think that that's important. Now, of course, conservatives immediately were grabbing this, talking about this and saying, oh, it's right wing. Conservatives have squandered their cultural cred, as I warned them at the time, by going nuts about Taylor Swift and, uh, you know, anything any famous woman does, they see the culture kind of writ large because their conservatives are sensitive to the feminizing of our society, which is something that happens to high civilizations in periods of decline. This is a very common, you know, the old saying that the British used to have when they had the empire was uh, England is, what was it? It was a paradise for women, a purgatory for men, and it's hell on the horses. And that's because civilized society is harder on men than it is on women. It's men build it for women, men build civilized societies for women, and then the women are free because they're safe and protected, and men feel like they're out of place. And that's kind of what's happened to our society, and then the left has used that to sort of feminize society. So rather than a dirty old right-winger weighing in here, I don't know where we would find a dirty old right winger, but let me turn to a similarly alluring lady, Bridget Phetasy, who does the podcast Walk-Ins Welcome, and she has learned about the joys of feminine virtue the hard way. She has looked at life from both sides, and she wrote a piece in The Spectator. She said, see, back in my day, kids, we could look at boobs and not feel bad about it, and that's a good thing. Then came the advent of the highly strung women's site, and understandably, stuff got weird. It's been weird ever since. There was a newfound mainstream media fixation on the male gaze. People were told to fixate on whether the female forms they viewed were realistic or body positive, rather than simply nice to look at. Writing in the red of... Writing for the red-blooded American male was hard enough, so I can only imagine what it was like to be one. Normie Americans everywhere, men and women, got used to walking on eggshells, things that we took for granted as being true. Comedians are allowed to be hyperbolic and offensive. The First Amendment is good. Men and women are different. We're suddenly up for debate. But now, yay, boobs are back. See, from time to time, industries that are dominated by women and gays, this is me talking now, not Bridget, you know, cultural things, photography, women's magazines, novels, things like that, try to convince us that what is really beautiful is girls who look like boys because women and gay men like young men, right? So they bring in models like Twiggy, who was Twiggy, and Kate Moss, who had a lovely face, but was just as, you just looked like a little boy. She looked like a young, a young boy. Let's not say a little boy. She looked like a, a young man. And the thing about a great rack is once you see it, you cannot see it. Once you bring back the fact that, in fact, men don't like to look at boys. They like to look at women who are shaped like women. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. And the same thing is true of the truth, which is the theme of today's show. You cannot understand what's happening right now in American politics if you don't understand that everything is about the flow of information and who controls it. And there's a reason for that, which is that leftism is a fantasy land and it depends on your living in the fantasy. And any reality that seeps in from outside destroys that fantasy. Ever since the, the election of Ronald Reagan, which the left similarly hated, as they did with Trump, an increasingly insulated complex of corporations, government, and media have combined to try to sell us a fantasy, like the fantasy that men like looking at women who are built like men. This is a country that we should love, and we're told that we should not love it. But this is a country, no matter what color we are, that has been good for all of us, not because it's always a good country. That is no such thing. I always hate it when people say, well, the country's not perfect. That's a stupid thing to say. That's a child thing to say. Nothing anywhere ever on earth is perfect. This country is the greatest idea, that, the greatest political idea that anyone has ever had. And it's the idea that the people should be sovereign and the government should be curtailed. And the left has created, used their power, their informational power to create this fantasy land in which 
No, no, no. The government is the good guy. They're going to solve all the problems. It's going to be a life of Julia. You'll be taken care of from cradle to grave. And you'll never even miss the freedom that has been stripped away from you. But the Internet came along and has broken up their information monopoly, just like the printing press broke up the information monopoly of the church. Now that fantasy land is burning down. And like Sidney Sweeney's breasts, the truth will come out. I am on the road, so I am away from my Beam Dream powder, so I didn't sleep at all last night. You want to try that Beam Dream? It contains a powerful, all-natural blend of reishi, L-theanine, apigenin, and melatonin to help you fall asleep, stay asleep, and wake up refreshed. It's not just your run-of-the-mill sleep aid. It's a concoction carefully crafted to help you slip into rest without the grogginess that often accompanies other sleep remedies. Sleep is the foundation of your mental and physical health. For me, I wouldn't know. You must have a consistent nighttime routine to function at your best. Today, my listeners get a special discount on Beam's Dream Powder, their best-selling hot cocoa for sleep with no added sugar, now available in delicious flavors like cinnamon cocoa, chocolate peanut butter, and mint chip. Better sleep has never tasted better. I used it. I have to say, it put it put me out. It really did. Before I even did this, the commercials, I looked at all of the ingredients. They all are useful and help you just slip down to sleep, and it's great. Just mix Beam Dream into hot water or milk, stir or froth, and enjoy before bedtime. If you find yourself battling the bedtime blues, give it a shot. Your weary self will thank you. If you want to try Beam's best-selling dream powder, take advantage of 40% off for a limited time when you go to shopbeam.com slash Clavin and use code Clavin at checkout. That's shopbeam.com slash Clavin with my promo code Clavin for up to 40% off your order. I love how they teach you how to spell beam like you don't it's Claven. you want to know how to spell Claven, which is k-l-a-v-a-n chapter two what a schmuck that state of the union was a disgrace it was an absolute disgrace joe biden is and has always been a mean divisive conniving dishonest corrupt person Always. He's always been that. And now he's also an old man. And like most really senile people, he can't hide it anymore under any kind of eloquence or suaveness or whatever he was. And that's grin, whatever he was hiding it behind before. It's just right out there. And it was an insane, insane fantasy. The media is striving with all its might to create this this insane fantasy that somehow the you know the speech was fiery or feisty and he was back and he's got the energy he's got the what did, what did one of them say he's got the the riz the charisma and all this stuff and this fantasy is burning down he is just a terrible guy now before I get to the state of the union I'm not going to play a lot of it I'm sure you heard enough of it I'll play a couple of cuts but I just want to remind you of the context which is the fact that Joe Biden. We kept calling him last night on backstage, we kept calling him diminished, but he's senile. It's not that he's old. There are plenty of vital old people. But, you know, Jacques Barzan, one of my favorite critics, wrote a masterpiece at 90. It's not that he's old. It's that he's senile. And it came out with the special prosecutor's argument, uh, Robert Herr, that Joe couldn't be prosecuted for his misuse of classified documents like Donald Trump because he was a sympathetic, well-meaning elderly man with a poor memory. So that set the regime media on fire and they have just absolutely humiliated themselves trying to tell us that, no, 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 this guy got even Saturday Night Live was making fun of it. And Joe Scarborough brought Saturday Night Live to life. This is cut four. I've said it for years now. He's cogent. Mm -hmm. But I undersold him when I said he was cogent. He's far beyond cogent. In fact, I think he's better than he's ever been intellectually, um, analytically, because he's been around for 50 years. And, you know, I don't know if people know this or not. Biden used to be a hothead. (laughs) Sometimes that Irishman would get in front of the reasoning. Sometimes he would say things he didn't want to say. This is and 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 I don't really you know what? I don't really care. Start your tape right now because I'm about to tell you the truth. And F you if you can't handle the truth. This version of Biden intellectually, analytically, is the best Biden ever. <laughs> play, play the Saturday Night Live clip now. I was just with him in behind closed doors. Joe is incredible. 
Yesterday we had a big meeting about the border and God, he had such command. He had charts, tables, PowerPoints. He had an interactive AR display on the Apple Vision Pro that he programmed himself. The software might be in beta, but the man, he's an alpha. <laughs> I wonder if Joe Scarborough ever looks in the mirror and thinks, that body had a soul in it once because he has become, he's become literally a, a, a Saturday Night Live joke. So just before we get to the State of the Union, which was meant to show that Biden is full of energy, I don't know what they pump him up with, but it meant, you know, that he's cogent, that he hasn't got any decline, that he's not senile. I just want to say, you know, F you to Joe Scarborough and show you a clip of Joe Biden from the late 1980s to show you how bad the decline has been. This is cut five. When I was 17 years old, like many of you, I participated in sit-ins to desegregate the restaurants and movie houses of Wilmington, Delaware. I came out of the civil rights movement. I was one of those guys that sat in and marched and all that stuff. I was involved, but I was not out marching. I was not down in Selma. I was not anywhere else. I was a suburbanite kid who got a dose of exposure to what was happening to black Americans when I'm in my own city. <laughs> See, he could lie so smoothly back then that you could actually, if you closed your eyes, you could actually believe and, and turned off your brain, you could actually believe that he was both a marching civil rights activist and not a marching civil rights activist at the same time during the same era. But when you hear the lies now, they're just all out there and he can't keep the meanness out. He's just a mean, corrupt person. And you can just see it. You can call his speech fiery, but it was incredibly ugly. I, I, I thought it, well, he starts off, this is the State of the Union, right? This is to bring what's happening in the executive branch to the other branches of government. And he starts off with the State of Our Union, which is our union with Ukraine. This is Cut 21. Not since President Lincoln and the Civil War have freedom and democracy been under assault at home as they are today. What makes our moment rare is the freedom and democracy are under attack at both at home and overseas at the very same time. <clears throat> overseas. Putin of Russia is on the march, invading Ukraine and sowing chaos throughout Europe and beyond. So not since the Civil War has our democracy been so threatened overseas. It's Putin invading Ukraine. Well, what's happening here? It's you. That's the problem here is you. You are Putin. You are the Civil War. Is cut 22. In a literal sense, history is watching. History is watching. Just like history watched three years ago on January 6th, when insurrectionists stormed this very capital and placed a dagger to the throat of American democracy. Many of you are here on that darkest of days. We all saw with our own eyes the insurrectionists were not patriots. They'd come to stop the peaceful transfer of power, to overturn the will of the people. January 6th lies about the 2020 election and the plots to steal the election posed a great, gravest threat to U.S. democracy since the Civil War. It's unbelievable, incredibly disgusting, ugly. Remember, you know, something like 80 million people voted for Donald Trump. This guy has just told all of them that they are the biggest threat to democracy in the country. So he ends his speech by saying he's a president for unity, and if you're not with him, you know, screw you, basically. First, I, I have to comment on this. I'm sorry, but in a literal sense, history is watching. In a literal sense, history is watching. See, I, Mike Johnson is sitting behind him. You know, there's a famous humorist, George S. Kaufman, who once wrote the line, I think, he rolled his eyes and then he had to go over under the table and get them back. That's the way I felt about Mike Johnson. If he rolled his eyes any harder, they were going to roll away. You know, January 6th, I've always said it was stupid from the very beginning. I said this is disgraceful. I think it was wrong. And I know the feds were in there stirring things up. And I know some people were led into the Capitol and all this stuff. But the conservative mantra is always we're all responsible for our own actions. And that's as true to me as for a black criminal on the street as it is for a white guy entering the Capitol illegally. At the same time, if you called the George riots Floyd riots, the George Floyd riots, mostly peaceful. If you inspired them by elevating this drug addict, resisting arrest to the level of a saint, if you generalized about police racism to make, you know, blacks feel like somehow criminality in their neighborhoods was not a bad thing, then you're responsible for your actions too. And you have no biz business demonizing the January 6th people. He said, you can't just love the country when you win. When have the Democrats ever loved this country? They don't even love it when they win. 
They don't even love it when they actually win the election. They always are attacking it. He's, he has said himself, it's a systemically racist country. And then Biden goes on, then the lie starts. Biden goes on to make this bunch of claims. Even the New York Times, I love the line they use. They said it needed context, which is what Democrat, what the New York Times says about Democrats when they lie, right? When Republicans lie, they lie. But when Democrats lie, it needs context. Context. He says he's added all these jobs. Most of them, the jobs were added and the deficit cut because of the absolute error of the pandemic spending and lockdowns that destroyed Trump's great economy. And Trump was part of that. Trump bears some responsibility for that. But he acted in ignorance along with most Western leaders. He did about, about what most Western leaders did, and it was terribly, terribly wrong. But he, he can't single him out. Whereas Biden already knew he was looking at a case of the flu, and he just kept it going, kept pouring the money into people. Even I mean, it was all fantasy, all his promises, all the things he said he was going to do for the climate. He said he would done them, basically, when those are his plans. They're not going to have any effect. Nothing he's done is going to have any effect on the climate except to make a bunch of his friends wealthy by funneling money to them because they're, you know, green. Even here during this complete fantasy, I'm not going to play any more of his speaking, but even here, fantasy land started to burn. Marjorie Taylor Greene rudely shouted out that Biden should say the name of Lake and Riley, the nursing student who was slaughtered by an illegal immigrant, which is Biden's fault. He opened the border. He invited them to surge. He shut down all of the executive orders that Trump had put in place, fighting Democrats every step of the way. He is responsible for what's happening at the border. He alone, he's doing it on purpose. He means to do it. He thinks these are going to be Democrat voters in the meantime. And here was the exchange with uh, MTG. I'd be a winner, not really. I. Lincoln, Lincoln Riley, an innocent young woman who was killed by an illegal. That's right. But how many of thousands of people being killed by illegals? <laughs> That's his answer. That's his answer. I mean, fantasy land is so much on fire that he can't spit on it enough to put it out. First, he gets the woman's wrong, name wrong. He calls her Lincoln instead of Lincoln. And, and secondly, he says uh, he says that she was killed by an illegal. So he alienates his group because they're supposed to call them newcomers. But also he says, how many thousands are killed by legals? And whose fault is that? that the murder rate is going up. Whose fault is that? It's the Democrats because they won't prosecute crimes. And, the, you know, the, they keep saying that crime is not going up. And I admit it's not as bad as it was in the 80s and 90s when the left's policies had had more time to seep into the culture and destroy it. But the FBI has changed the way it gives out crime statistics. They're not getting full crime statistics. They're not up to date. And all I know is when you go into stores, all the goods are locked up. Sometimes you have to get a guide. To, you know, if you want to buy a razor or something, you have to get a guide. The stores are cl being closed because they're being ransacked. Even in San Francisco, they want to get tougher on crime. In New York, Kathy Hochul, the governor, has dispatched the National Guard into New York subways. It's the same time they're telling us that it's no problem that all these illegals have flooded the city. Then at the State of the Union, there was also Steve Nikoi. I'm not sure how he pronounces his name, but he was the father of a young Marine who was killed at the Kabul airport during Biden's surrender in Afghanistan. And just remember that the Kabul airport was in the position that it was in because he closed the American military base where they could have, they could have flown out safely, but he closed it against the advice, the whole thing was against the advice of his military advisors because Joe Biden would be the smartest person in the room if there was no one else in the room. So this father, this morning gold star father, started shouting in the middle of the speeches 24. All Americans deserve the freedom to be safe. And America is safer today than when I took office. Year before I took office, murder rates went up 30 percent. 30 percent they went up. The biggest increase in history. It was then, through, no, through my American Rescue Plan, which every American voted against, I'm mad at, we made the largest investment in public safety ever. And again, that decline in the murder rates was because of the pandemic, the lockdowns people took to the streets. 
So the guy, the father was shouting Abbey Gate, which is the place at the airport where the suicide bomb went off, killing 13 American service members, none of which would happen if Joe Biden had not taken control of that situation. And of course, it was the surrender and the chaos of the surrender and the weakness of the surrender that encouraged Putin to go into Afghanistan in the first place, as well as Biden saying, well, he might tolerate a small incursion into Ukraine and add to that his destruction of the Abraham Accords and his kowtowing to Iran and they're allowing them to build nuclear weapons, which they're doing. All the international observers say they've completely lost track of what Iran is doing, making everyone essentially except that they're getting the materials to build nuclear weapons. So that means that the murder by terrorist rapists Hamas in Israel, that is also on his, to his credit, I, I shouldn't say that, it's, he's to blame for it. I, unbelievable. It is unbelievable. That was this, this speech that is all the fault of the J6 rioters and when he was responsible for everything. And the truth is leaking through. Can you just imagine, just Think for a minute what it would have been like if Trump had been making a speech and a gold star father stood up and blamed him for what had happened in Afghanistan. It would be the story for the next six weeks. So they, they tried to hide things. They hid the pictures of the squad wearing Arab headgear and holding up signs saying things like lasting ceasefire, which is a, an oxymoron. That's not what ceasefire means. And of course, the Democrat voters who packed the streets uh, protesting in in uh, favor of Hamas, these killers, uh, and held up Biden getting to the Capitol. And look, I, I have to say, as always, the GOP response, you just can't make a response to the State of the Union. People should stop doing it. But this time they put in this, this lady, Alabama Senator Katie Britt, and I'll just play a, a little snippet of it because it wasn't what she said so much as the tone, her tone of her voice. I never could have imagined what my story would entail to think about what the American dream can do across to just one generation in just one lifetime. Okay, just a little too much girl for, for us for us Republicans. But if you wanted to bring the testosterone, Donald Trump's response, I thought was actually really good. It's cut 19. No matter what Crooked Joe says, his actions prove his priority is to import a colossal new illegal alien population and let them all stay my priority is securing our border and sending Crooked Joe's illegals back home. Likewise, the sight of a feeble Joe Biden talking about shrinkflation, the term he uses, is one of the most ridiculous things this country has ever seen. Shrinkflation is just another way of saying inflation. It means that you're losing a lot of money because these people don't know what they're doing. It was all caused by crooked Joe Biden and the people that surround him. And they are radical left Marxists and fascists and communists and socialists. We have people running our country, the likes of which we have never seen before. He and the communists and his party looted trillions of dollars from you and spent it on illegal aliens and the Green News scam, triggering the highest inflation in many, many decades. So love Donald Trump or hate him, what he just said happens to be true, you know, they can't keep this information down. This is the thing. The information is like a fire. And because of the internet and because people understand what has happened in this country and how the government and corporations and the media have all linked together as one unit, they understand it, they see it, this information is getting out and the fantasy land that unit created is catching flames. It's in flames. It really is. It's in front of our eyes. It's just going up in smoke. You know, most State of the Unions accomplish absolutely nothing. They'll be forgotten in a few days, and this one will probably be forgotten too. But the image of that old senile corruptocrat screaming at us for not loving our high inflation and high crime and our, the invasion of our borders and America at war when it wasn't just before he took office, that may just accomplish something, namely the election of Donald Trump. No one likes to talk about life insurance, but it's very important. You need to include it in your financial planning this year. Start shopping now with Policy Genius. Find the right policy to protect your family today and give yourself the peace of mind that comes with knowing that if something were to happen to you, your family can cover all their expenses while getting back on their feet. 
Policy Geniuses technology makes comparing life insurance quotes from America's top insurers easy in just a few clicks. I've tried it. It's incredibly easy to navigate. You already have a life insurance policy through work, but that might not offer enough protection for your family's needs, and it may not follow you if you leave your job. You need a backup plan. With Policy Genius, you can find life insurance policies that start at just $292 per year for a million dollars of coverage. Some options offer same-day approval and avoid unnecessary medical exams. Policy Genius has licensed agents who can help you find the best fit for your needs. When they make it this easy, there's no excuse not to do it. Policy Genius works for you, not the insurance companies. That means they are not incentivized to recommend one insurer over another so you can trust their guidance. Save time, money, and provide your family with a financial safety net using Policy Genius. Head to policygenius.com slash Clavin or click the link in the description to get your free life insurance quotes and see how much you could save. That's policygenius.com slash Clavin. And did you know there are no E's in Clavin? I just make it look this easy. There are no E's in Chapter three, I'll have no Doritos with my no Bud Light. So this is happening all over. The truth coming out all over. New York declares itself a sanctuary city, and then the governor has to put the National Guard into police the subways. Uh, Businesses and activist investors like BlackRock are admitting that DEI and social justice investing doesn't work, and they're starting to pull back. Oregon decriminalized drugs, and the governor there now has a bill on his desk that recriminalizes drugs. Doritos, the Dorito people, like a bunch of freaking idiots, hire a guy who calls himself Samantha Hudson to add a little woman face to their advertisements in Spain, and they got threatened with a Bud Light-type boycott, and Samantha had to hit the road. And Donald Trump is in the midst of what has to be one of the greatest comebacks in political history, even if he doesn't win the general election. Just the fact that he has come back from what the left is doing to him is amazing. So Trump sweeps the table, except for the socialist state of Vermont, on Super Tuesday. He's essentially the nominee. He's not a sure thing by any means. You know, he's got a lot of, he's got money troubles. He's not raising as much money as Biden is. He's got legal trouble, obviously. He's got media trouble. The media just hates him. And he's, and it's in a, a full court press by the regime uh, led by the corrupt attorney general, Merrick Garland. I think under Democrats, they should just retitle the attorney general to corrupt attorney general. It should be the CAG. Uh, but but this is also about information. Great column by Holman Jenkins Jr., one of my favorite columnists. He's in the Wall Street Journal. And he says, this is what he says. He says, someone, somebody at America's 100 million dinner tables might still say Trump was a Russian agent, that January 6th was an organized insurrection, the Hunter Biden laptop was fake, Hunter and Joe did nothing wrong, Trump called neo-Nazis fine people. But now somebody else can say, Did you know and point to multiple government investigations by the Justice Department Inspector General and special counsels? They can point to videos and transcripts online of Mr. Trump's undistorted, unmisrepresented words. So in other words, the information is available, as Paul Simon might have said, the information is available to the mortal man. These videos and transcripts available online because Elon Musk and others and Substack won't censor them is showing us what the mainstream media is. So the information slowly reaches people after the mainstream media has poured on the lies. And I know it's frustrating to be surrounded by that absolute fog of lies that NBC and ABC and CBS and the New York Times and the Washington Post and CNN all pour out. But the fact that you get the lies first And then slowly the points of light start showing through as the truth comes out has an effect. And the effect is, oh, these people are lying to me. These people are liars. I can't trust them. I can't trust ABC and NBC and CBS and the New York Times and the Washington Post because they're not telling me the truth. And that's exactly what's happening. And that's exactly why the fantasy land is crumbling. The media has lost its credibility entirely because first they lie to us and then we see the truth. That system that they've been trying to plug up and they can't and they never will be able to is destroying them. You know, the Supreme Court decided nine to nothing, nine to nothing, that Trump could not be taken off the ballot by some county clerk in whatever state where he said, like, I don't like Donald Trump, he's off the ballot. No, they can't do that. Nine to O, the Supreme Court said, and the media took it badly. It's cut 12.
We've learned that it was a nine to nothing decision ruling that Donald Trump can be on the ballot in Colorado and other states. I'm not confident that that will produce a result that's good for American democracy. This is actually what I had been concerned about. I had been concerned that it should it go to the Supreme Court, they would rule this way. I'd laugh if it weren't so sad. My next guest says Donald Trump is still an oath-breaking insurrectionist. Do you have confidence in the Supreme Court? Do you think this court is partisan? The court itself may have overstepped. The court went way further than it needed to go. Our colleague Melissa Murray has called this Supreme Court the YOLO court. The criticism of the court is that they're playing interference. Not since Bush v. Gore have we seen a court that has had this many opportunities to interfere in the election. They have, they have so many opportunities to interfere in the election because of the left's lawfare. That's why, because they're trying to put their opponent in prison. So yes, that's going to go up to the Supreme Court. But in a 9-0 decision, it's a little hard to make the argument that they're partisan, you know? And they must have thought of that because suddenly they started saying, well, it's, an, you know, it's a unanimous decision. But it's not really because they disagreed about things, which they always do. And some felt that the some of the conservative justices went too far. In fact, I think Amy Coney Barrett thought that. But, you know, they by, because they said only Congress can keep him off the ballot. But no, I'm sorry. When you lose 9-0 at the Supreme Court, it is probably because you're wrong, because they're so far apart politically, and they see things, their theories of the law are so different. So that's not going to work. I mean, that's not going anywhere. You know, a, a good way to see how bad this information disaster is for the left is to go to the capital of fantasy land, which it's like going to uh, uh, Atlanta during the Civil War. You go to the capital of fantasy land, which is the New York Times opinion page, or as we call it, Knucklehead Row. Oh, hey, hey, oh, hey, oh, let's go waltzing down to Knucklehead Row. So one op-ed in the opinion page this week was this panicked op-ed by Jennifer Medina and Reed Epstein called Do Americans Have a Collective Amnesia About Donald Trump? This is a reaction to his victories on Super Tuesday as if people had forgotten. And they go on basically like a psychiatric diagnosis about how Americans and people forget, they forget the chaos, they forgot the horrible things. And of course, they don't mention that they caused the chaos. But finally, after we've all been diagnosed with these various illnesses that we don't see the way these wonderful people on Knucklehead Row see, they say this. They say there are different ways that people remember Trump. You know, she was talking to one person who said, Mr. Trump... Uh, he remembered Mr. Trump saying he had a great friendship with the North Korean dictator, a government shutdown, Mexico not paying for the border wall, Mr. Trump describing very fine people on both sides at a white supremacist rally, his supporters storming the Capitol. But that left out a whole host of major and minor dramas. Listen to this list. The recording of Mr. Trump saying he could grab women by the genitals, praising Russian intelligence, crudely disparaging African countries, separating children from their parents at the Mexican border, telling children Santa Claus isn't real, which he never did, considering buying Greenland, suggesting using nuclear weapons to stop a hurricane, threatening to withhold aid from Ukraine if its president wouldn't investigate the Biden family, suggesting COVID patients inject bleach, which he also never did. Most of that didn't happen. Most of what she just said, they said, didn't, did not happen. And the stuff that did, you ask yourself, you know, did it affect my life? Did it affect my life if he said something crude? What he said about uh, Haiti, I believe, he called it a, a hellhole, as it were. Do I care? It is a hellhole. It, there's no question about that Haiti is an absolute collapsed country. You know, did it change my life? So, then they talk about the things that, quote unquote, Republicans remember. And this is what it is. The climbing stock market, tax cuts, deregulation, pulling out of the Paris Climate Accord, abandoning the nuclear deal with Iran, the Abraham Accords, codifying peace between Israel and several Arab countries, fewer illegal crossings at the U.S.-Mexico border. Almost none by the time his, uh, his administration was over. All of those things did happen, and all of them were not just positive, but affected our lives. They were all positive, and they all affected our lives. So you can tell, I mean, they're even saying the quiet part out loud at the New York Times. Thomas Edsel, he's a far-left opinion writer, but I repeat myself, 
His column is called, This Could Well Be Game Over. He's talking about the Supreme Court decisions. He says, well, the Supreme Court ruling on Monday that states cannot bar, remember the title, This Could Well Be Game Over. The the Supreme Court ruling on Sunday that states cannot bar Donald Trump from appearing on their presidential ballots garnered a lot of attention. The more politically consequential decision came on February 28th when the court set a hearing on Trump's claim of presidential immunity for the week of April 22nd. Remember, I told you this. That delay is both a devastating blow to President Trump's campaign and a major assist to Trump's multi-pronged effort to minimize attention to the details of the 91 felony charges against him. It increases the likelihood that neither of the two federal indictments of Trump will come to trial before the November election. A failure to hold at least one of these trials before November 5th would undermine a key Democratic goal to expand voters' awareness of the dangers posed by a second Trump term. In other words, they are, the Democrats, are running a banana republic. If they can't put their opposition in jail, they can't beat him. Well, why would that be? Why would it be that they can't beat him? I mean, Trump for the first time is leading in several polls, especially in New York Times poll, which has him four points ahead. And you forget the people who say that the election was stolen, forget he never led in the polls. Trump never led in the polls during that entire election. He's leading in them now. Why? Well, for one thing, the economy. I mean, the economy is a a way that information travels. That is what a market is. That's what a free market is. That's why destroying the free market, as Biden was threatening to do to the medical market last night, when you destroy a market, then you don't find out what's working, what isn't working. That's what it, why, why a free market is like a free flow of information. So what they want to tell you is the mark, the economy is great. Paul Krugman, the nutcase. But Bidenomics is still working very well. I think you have to say that with him. Bidenomics is still working very well. The economic news in 2023, says Paul Krugman, was almost miraculously good. Your life has been an economic miracle, right? Not only did America's economy defy widespread predictions of recession, it also defied claims that only a significant rise in unemployment could bring inflation under control. Instead, we got a combination of strong growth, unemployment near a 50-year low, and plunging inflation. So let's ask an ordinary guy, a dad, who went to the grocery store and bought the cheapest stuff he could find and came back with two meals. Cut eight. Take a guess. Take a guess at what it costs, and you're probably wrong. $123, $123 that was with all my discounts for barely two nights of dinner, barely two nights. I remember when I could spend about 120 bucks and get groceries for a whole week, and that was breakfast, lunch, and dinner for all of us. And $123 is gonna get me through the next two days. I can't do this much longer. Financially, I can't. I don't want to spend the money, but it's also just killing me. And I make decent money, so something's got to give here. So you can say, hey, that's just one guy. But Jeffrey Anderson of American Main Street Initiative was writing in City Journal. You remember we interviewed him a few weeks back. He wrote a, a uh, an article called No Great Mystery, meaning it's no great mystery why people aren't as happy with the economy as the fantasy land media is. He says... There's a straightforward explanation for the door public mood. Americans really, really don't like it when the prices of seemingly everything, groceries, Big Macs, gas, airplane, tickets, houses, and more, are noticeably higher than they were just a few years ago. While Paul Krugman may characterize a 3.4% increase in consumer prices over the 12-month period ending this last December as plunging inflation, most Americans likely just noticed that prices already quite high at the start of 2023 were even higher by year's end. According to figures from the Bureau of Labor Statistics reflecting the consumer price index for all urban consumers, Biden has presided over inflation numbers through the first three years of his presidency that were higher than those of all but one other elected president in the last 100 years, guess who, Jimmy Carter. On top of which, by the way, the Biden response, you know, let's, let's take a look at some other, you know, uh, Media Research Center, MRC, put out some economic uh, charts, six charts the media don't want you to see. Gas prices, 242 a gallon under Trump, 320 a gallon under Biden, up 32%. Real wages gone down under Biden. Mortgage rates under Trump down 32 percent under Biden up 140 
percent savings rates up 129 percent under Trump, down 71 percent under Joe Biden. Prices are going up more than three times faster under Biden. Persistent inflation, average inflation under Trump, 1.9 percent. Average monthly inflation under Biden, five, what was it, 5.7 percent. And the Biden response, by the way, is absolutely insane. The administration has a new strike force led by the Justice Department, or as we call them, the CJD, the Corrupt Justice Department, and the Federal Trade Commission is going to, quote, stop illegal corporate behavior that hike prices on American families through anti-competitive, unfair, deceptive, or fraudulent business practices on The White House Council, I'm reading from the Wall Street Journal now, on cue, the White House Council of Economic Advisors on Tuesday said the administration's actions are already yielding billions of dollars in savings for Americans. Check your pocket. There's probably a billion dollars in there now. While inflation has moderated, moderated, prices for services and food in particular continue to rise faster than they did before President Biden entered office. And you know shrinkflation, where they're giving you less in in a cookie pack, you know, Cookie Monster was complaining. He said, me not getting big enough cookies anymore. Inflation doesn't rise. Inflation rise. Here it is, Cookie Monster. Me hate shrinkflation. Me cookies are (laughs) getting smaller. Inflation does not rise because of corporate greed. It rises because of government policies, especially printing money. And everything that he promised in the State of the Union last night is printing money. Money. Let's go to, since we're talking about cartoon characters, since we're talking about Cookie Monster and and Biden is quoting Cookie Monster, let's go to a cartoon character who actually actually understands money, Scrooge McDuck. Uncle Scrooge, why don't they just print up a few billion or so? A few billion? Oh dear, no. My, that word billion, how it's abused. If it weren't so frightening, I'd be amused. Folks have no conception. We'd have inflation. Inflation? Ah, that's a mess. Your money would be worth less and less. I might take this hat full, I dare say, to buy what your piggy bank would buy today. A dollar wouldn't be worth the paper it's printed on. I guess this was before Disney was teaching little kids to bugger one another. Uh, But yeah, that's it. That's how you get inflation. You print more money, money becomes worth less and less, and and the prices have to go up and up. You know, information reaches us in a lot of ways, and we talk about the press and the media and all this stuff, but it also reaches you through money. Money is information. That is, that's essentially what a market is. And you, when you are having trouble feeding your kids, when you are having trouble making your salary last, when you are having trouble getting the things that your father and mother got, like a home and like a, a, a life where you don't have to worry all the time, and they come out and tell you things are great. They say, you know, what's wrong with you? And they they scold you like Joe Biden did last night. They scold you for not being happy with all the wonderful things he's doing. The only answer are the immortal words of Joe Scarborough, F you. Fume. You know, the only bad habit I ever regretted was smoking. It was just bad for me and it was not worth doing. But you try to break a habit. A bad habit like that. It sometimes feels like climbing Mount Everest in flip-flops. I have been there, and that's why fume sounds to me like a breath of fresh air. It's not about giving up. It's about switching up. Fume takes your habit and simply makes it better, healthier, and a whole lot more enjoyable. Fume is an innovative, award-winning flavored air device that uses flavored air instead of vapor. Instead of harmful chemicals, fume uses delicious flavors like crisp mint, orange vanilla, maple pepper, and sparkling grapefruit. Fume flavors are what herbal tea is to soda, not as sweet and much more natural. Fume is designed with movable parts and magnets for fidgeting because keeping your fingers busy is helpful for de-stressing while breaking your habit. It's well-weighted, perfectly balanced, and aesthetically designed with a premium walnut barrel and a smooth coating on the mouthpiece. Plus, Fume just released a magnetic stand so you don't lose it around the house. Kick your bad habits today by going to tryfume.com slash Clavin, and you'll get 10% off with promo code Clavin. That's tryfum.com slash K-L-A-V-A-N. No ease. There are no easy things. Final chapter, notes from the front line. Another kind of information that you get is the information you get in your gut. And you know 
whether you're living in fear or not. And COVID showed us how much a feminized society, especially, is vulnerable to fear tactics, right? You don't know what a disease is. You don't know what you're supposed to do. You're relying on experts to tell you. And when they tell you, and everything they tell you turns out to be false and oppressive and politically directed, that information reaches you eventually. You know, we talked about, I think it was last week, we were talking about Gemini, the AI from Google, and how it was polluted with DEI racism and couldn't tell whether Elon Musk was worse than Hitler and so on. And they lost billions off their stock shares. And you think, how did that happen? You know, it's Google. Don't they have the technique, the technicians to make a good AI that's not going to embarrass them? Well, Mike Solano was writing at the Pirate Wire. He wrote something called Google's Culture of Fear, in which he went and interviewed a lot of people in the company. And he says, the only thing connecting employees is a powerful, sprawling HR bureaucracy that, yes, is totally obsessed with left-wing political dogma. But the company's zealots are only capable of thriving because no other font of power asserts or even attempts to assert any kind of meaningful influence. The phrase, Culture of fear was used by almost everyone I spoke with, and not only to explain the dearth of resistance to the company's craziest DEI excesses, but to explain the dearth of innovation from what might be the highest concentration of talented technologists in the world. People can't make stuff if they're afraid to make stuff, right? They have to have, their imagination also has to be free. Now, you know, I'm an artist, and I believe the arts are one of the most important ways in which we communicate with one another. And I've had artists on the show n- numerous times who are canceled, young guys a lot of times. And they, uh, some of them, they call me the OG because they know I've been through it. They know I got thrown out of Hollywood. They know I've had thing- ups and downs in my life. Like I'll never win another award for my mystery novels, which are as good, if not better, than most of the, almost any of the mystery novels out there. But, you know, I'm a hard guy. I, I actually am. I'm a, a hard man. And most artists are sensitive people. You know, they're sensitive people. And to have your rising career, especially when you're a young person, crushed because you wouldn't take a vaccine or you wouldn't say men are women or you voted for Donald Trump. And suddenly you cannot do what God appointed you to do. Artists are appointed, they're given inspiration by God. This is a horrible thing. And it drives young of these, many of these young men that I see to despair and craziness. Now, my Cameron Winter books, which you have made bestsellers are published by Mysterious Press, which is an independent press run by Otto Penzler, one of my oldest friends, and the greatest mystery editor alive. He has been the greatest mystery. He's 112 years old. Uh, he's a little, little older than me, so he must be 140 years old. But he has been one, one of the greatest mystery editors of the age. There's no famous mystery writer who does not owe Otto and some not famous guys. And I owe him my career because he published me at a time when I was rejected completely and when the newspapers came after me and when the, you know, the... Um, they wouldn't promote me and all this stuff because of my politics. He, he kept publishing me, even though he wasn't making money off me. And I'm, I owe him big. Every year, there's a big mystery writer convention uh, called BoucherCon after Anthony, Anthony Boucher. And this year is here in Nashville. So the guest of honor this year was supposed to be Anthony Horowitz, who is a massively talented and prolific writer. Uh, he wrote Foil's War and The Magpie Murders, a recent novel which I read, which was great. I've never met him, but I hear he's a really good guy. And he asked Otto to interview him because Otto had made him edit Otto's famous mystery anthology, The Best Mysteries of the Year, in which I've been in two or three times. But Otto is being canceled. They first they gave him the interview. They said Otto is going to interview uh, is going to interview Horowitz, and then the little Twitter non entities, these nobodies who've never accomplished anything in their lives, start waging war against him because he publishes a lot of white men, because he, they say he doesn't publish enough women, because they say he's never appointed a uh, black editor to his anthology, he asked Walter Mosley, because Walter Mosley is the only black mystery writer big enough, famous enough to be the editor of Otto's prestigious anthology. And because he defended Linda Fairstein, who was the DA in the 1989 Central Park rape case and also became a mystery writer, she was going to be given a um, Lifetime Achievement Award by the Mystery Writers of America, a Grand Master Award is called, by the Mystery Writers of America, which I belong to and who have given me a couple of uh, Edgars and they've nominated me five times. And... They took it back from her because once the guys in the, you know, the Central Park Five were released, they took back, they wouldn't give her the Grand Master Award, uh, which was a small, mean, 
wrong, stupid thing and cowardly thing to do. And Otto, because he's Otto, wrote them a letter telling them that, saying they should have they should have given her the award. And by the way, those five guys who were released were never exonerated. Read Ann Coulter on this. She will tell you they confessed to it. You know, they they were questioned rightly. They were convicted. There was no DNA was an experimental a thing at that time. So they say, well, there was no DNA evidence. Nobody, even the prosecutor at the time, didn't say they had raped that woman, but she was beaten by a mob. And the, whether or not they were in that mob, I think it's pretty clear if you read Anne's work about this. So Otto was, prob- was, was way right. And Linda Fairstein was just doing her job anyway. So they canceled. Baltrican canceled Otto. And Anthony Horowitz, to his credit, said he wouldn't come. Now, I'm being constantly, constantly told in my in movies and publishing. I'm not in, really in movies anymore, but in publishing, I just compromise. Just cut this one line. Just change this one word. And and once or twice in my life, I've been unsure of myself whether I was in the right, and I've sort of made modifications. But I have also lost six figures worth of income in publishing when I wouldn't edit out the Christianity from my Homelander series in England, and I've lost millions, I'm sure, in Hollywood. And I'm not a radical. I am not a radical. I am easy to work with. I love editors. I work with editors. I'm not afraid to compromise on things that I think are right. But these woke thugs are not people who have gone too far. This equity and the DAI and the anti-racism and transgender, it's not gone too far. These are evil people. This is wickedness. This is deviance. This is child-destroying, career-destroying wickedness. And I will not I will not compromise with them, and nobody can. So they've taken an ordinary person like me, not a radical, not a far-right guy, and they've turned me into a martyr, or they've tried to, right? You know, during the Reformation, there was a guy, you know, a lot of people were killed defending their conscience in the Reformation. And one guy was Bishop Hugh Latimer, and I want to talk about him because he was attacked by the Catholics, he was attacked by the Protestants, he was, you know, attacked by Henry VIII, he was attacked by the Catholic Church, because he followed his conscience, because he was a man of conscience. He was finally burned uh, under Catholic Queen Mary, and he was tied to a stake with a guy named Hugh Latimer, and, uh, well, I'm sorry, with a guy named Nicholas Ridley, and Hugh Latimer turned to him, he was a bishop, and he said, play the man, Master Ridley, we shall this day light such a candle by God's grace in England, as I trust shall never be put out. Now, I want to tell you, some of these artists I've had on the show have been driven almost to despair and and madness by being canceled, by being told they can't do what they want to do. And Otto and I are two tough old men, and we were tough young men, and we've carved out great careers while doing and saying exactly what we wanted. But along the way, we have both been cut off and thwarted and insulted and attacked for what we believe. And I, when I appeal to you to buy my books and tell you they're really good and I'll get canceled if you don't support me, I'm, I'm telling you because the books, are, I think, are top-notch, A1 a- mystery writing, and I'm defended by you, by you buying me, but I know what it's like to be young. I know what it's like to be cut out. I know what it's like not to be able to give your gift to the world, and you have to understand something all politics aside. I want to just say to artists who have been canceled, to everybody who's been canceled, who is trying to get the word out— This is an epoch-making, generations-long fight over the flow of information. This is like like the invention of the printing press. The the internet has created that sort of flight over who controls the flow of information. And the most important information is beauty, the work of the imagination, because beauty is truth, and truth is the word of the living God. So I've been there, and I know what it's like. And I just want to say to anyone who's being canceled, who is trying to speak the truth, who is being canceled because they're trying to speak the truth, play the man. They may set us on fire, but we will light a candle that will burn their evil fantasy land to the ever-loving ground. Russia has been in the headlines for weeks due to the actions of Vladimir Putin. To comprehend Putin's motivations, we have to examine the historical context that shaped his behavior. In the new season of What We Saw, An Empire of Terror, host Bill Whittle unmasks communism by taking a close look at the history of the Soviet Union with the use of deep-cut photographs and film, journal entries, and other primary sources. This tale of terror offers a compelling presentation of the horrors that plagued the Soviet Union and the viciousness of its leaders. Modern-day Russia has been centuries in the making, and this series will give you a better understanding of its history as well as the communism that threatens our own homeland. Watch episode one streaming now on Daily Wire+. Plus. If you're not a Daily Wire Plus member, you should go to dailywire.com slash subscribe to become a member today. Bill Whittle, always worth watching. 
Clavin clapbacks. Cookie! Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy! <laughs> hey! Where cookies go? Yeah! <laughs> We're all asking that, Cookie Monster. Clavin Clapax at dailywire.com. Clavin and Clapax spelled with a K. Write in, tell us about the show. We have to hurry here. Uh, this one is from Linford. He says Speaking on the topic of the ongoing wholesale slaughter and forced starvation of women and babies in Gaza, Andrew Blinken, Biden, Shapiro, Clavin, BBSK informed us this is not genocide, this is war. It is unclear whether this opinion was given to BBSK by B and or B and or S, or if BBSK is indeed a demonic, bloodthirsty goblin like they are. It saddens me to have to discontinue my weekly listening, but I can no longer tolerate cheerleading for death. Uh, regards, Linford. Well, I'm not going to attack the ignorance and really moral silliness of that attack. But I, there is something I do want to say because I keep seeing this on X, this idea that somehow people tell us what to say. It, you know, that we have little meetings that we gather together that Ben tells us, you know, influences us or Jeremy tells us we can't say this, we can't say that. I've been here since the beginning. We started this company. I was here at the very start, the very first day of this company. And before, I was working with Ben and Jeremy before. I have quit more movies than probably any screenwriter who has ever lived simply because they wanted me to do something I didn't want to do. I have given up lots and lots of money. I'm a, I'm a crusty, I, listen, I've been, I have been a crusty old man since I was a crusty young man. I do not compromise with anybody. At this company, you know, I'm, I'm friends with Jeremy and Ben, but we wouldn't be friends and we wouldn't be men if we didn't sometimes clash. Men, friends, clash. And because we're doing something important, we're saying important things. And so we've definitely clapped. Not once, not ever in the entire time I've been here has anybody told me what to say. Not once. No one has ever said, you know, you got to go in this direction. you got to go in that direction. And that's the only thing I want to clear up about this. Because I see it on X all the time. They're having these meetings or they've got to say this or they got to say that. Never. Never happened. Not once. It's a total fantasy. And so I just, I just want to point that out because each of us say different things. And, you know, sometimes people say, uh, you know, some pretty wild things and things that I strongly, strongly disagree with, but no one has ever said anything like that. So at least you're hearing my my true opinion, because if I weren't doing that, we wouldn't be friends, right? I, if I were lying to you, if I were hiding you, if I was kowtowing to somebody above me, then we wouldn't be friends. You are getting it straight. And that's the only thing I want to say. Obviously, I disagree with this guy. And Here's another thing I want to say. You should become a member today. If for no other reason than that, go to dailywire.com slash subscribe and use code Clavin at checkout for two months free on all annual plans. If you're not a member, <laughs> poof, darkness, flames, clavenlessness. It's just, it's horrible. I can't watch. But if you are, come to member block now.